occurred, which was the supervisor came clean. I find it hard to believe that he didn't know in August what had actually happened. I find it hard to believe that our colleagues in the town government weren't aware of what was done with the legislature. Understand, a legislature is not one year, it's a two session. So you have it introduced in one year, it could go over to the second year. We're in the second year of it. It's not dead yet. It's not legally dead yet. Now, the final point is, you know what was really broken here? Our trust. I trusted my brothers and sisters would look out for me. I never thought in the 27 years I lived here that people would go behind our backs and lobby to levy taxes without representation. Do the right thing. Tom. Be honest. Tom. Own up to it. Thank you. When does he use the card? First of all, I'm running against Jim. I had nothing to do with the things he's talking about. But in any event, he was talking about levying taxes. Let's be clear here. If the bill had passed the assembly, it would have to pass the Senate, signed by the governor, then the town board would have to vote on and then the town would have a public referendum at the November election. So nobody was going to secretly levy anybody's taxes, including this forum that Jim talks to talked about. It was not a forum on open space or about how to fund it. It was a real estate lobbyist and two realtors um, and Jim Foster to talk about this horrible thing. Well, of course, people from the real estate industry are not going to want any kind of tax. But it was not a pa the panelists that were invited were not representing different viewpoints. It was Fox News or MSNBC, whichever network you like to watch. It was one viewpoint, and that's not the way I would govern. I would govern by allowing different viewpoints to be heard, and that, that didn't occur at that meeting. Thank you, sir. Can I rebut? Yes, you can. So if card? that, do I have to use my card? Yes. Yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah, I like these cards. So um, I would agree. We should have had an open forum, but the open forum should have occurred before it went to the legislature. That's the reality. I just want you to be honest with me. I'm not trying to say government is bad. I rather like government. I rather like our government officials. I believe in them. I trusted them. I'm saying to you, they didn't do the right thing, and they did know. And Mr. Van Leuven admitted that he was aware of this situation, but he didn't. He argued with the previous supervisor, but he didn't come out and say to us, we have a difference of opinion. Why is that? That's the problem with one political party having dominance. That's why you need competition on the board where there's not everybody goes along and gets along. I would have fired him up. I would have stood up to them and blown the, blown the whistle and said, this is not appropriate. Let's level with our brothers and sisters, tell them what we're up to. And by the way, maybe it would have been appropriate I'm, to have an open forum about other I'm, ways to fund this. I'm not done. Too bad. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Our next question is directed to Mr. Carriero. Would you favor a town preservation fund without the transfer tax, yes or no, and why? If yes, how would you fund it? If no, what are your concerns over establishing one? Well, I, I would be in favor of one. Um, I think our environment here is under brutal attack, and I would want to work with conservationists and people to find out ways to develop a solution. Jim's ways may not be the best, but one of the solutions I would call for is using estate planning as a mechanism to fund this. In counseling our clients at the bank, we often had to say to them, you need to give money to nonprofits. You need to make contributions. You need to support your community for two reasons. One, it may be a tax advantage, but secondly, you certainly have enough that it would be a good idea to leave a legacy to your community. We've not even attempted that in the strategy that's been followed. So I believe in conservation. I would defend it fiercely, but I would turn to this community and say, let's develop a strategy to do that. My suggestion is going to people to say, let's sit down and chat, and here's my estate attorney that we could use that will give you some direction. People want to give. I see it all the time in the foundations that I serve on. They love this community. People are willing to help. We have to ask them in an appropriate way. 
taxing them and forcing them to sell their land because they can't afford the tax is not a good strategy, as evidenced by the outcome. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coffey. Yes, yes, yes. I am in favor of an open space preservation fund. Uh, it was talked about in the original comp plan. We need to follow through on it. 36 communities in New York State currently have some kind of open space fund program. There's a variety of funding methods that you can use. I don't believe anybody uses estate planning as a method. Uh, and call me pessimistic, but I don't think simply asking people to voluntarily turn over money is going to be successful without having some kind of uh, aspect of, uh, uh, of taxing authority, if you will. Um, the method that Clifton Park uses, as I understand it, if a developer gets a zoning variance and is allowed to put another unit in there, they have to pay $30,000 into a fund per extra unit. I have no problem with looking into something like that where we could require the developer uh, who, who's coming into our town and building uh, extra units to put money into a fund. Um, some have enacted this 2% transfer tax, but many have not gone up to 2%. It could, the town of Warwick, for example, does a 0.75% uh, transfer tax. So we could use a variety of methods, either uh, some kind of uh, transfer tax or um, make the developer pay for it. Um, but I do think it's long overdue, and I do think we need to start that conversation sooner rather than later. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carriero. So, um, a great strategy might be to say you're against the transfer tax and stick with that. Number two, let's use all the potential ideas other than the transfer tax to accomplish what we both agree on. That's what's called meeting you halfway. Let's figure out all the possible solutions, but this one is not acceptable. Therefore, why would you bring it up again? I don't care what Warwick's strategy was. We don't want it. And that's why all the effort was put into visiting 3,000 homes this summer is to talk about it. And I want to tell you, both Democrats and Republicans and independents and conservatives and uh, non-affiliated agreed with me, the vast majority. What was fun was when I actually found people that disagreed with me and I got to spend some time with me. They were interesting because they had other ideas, and I really appreciated that. I think we need Fine. to do more Thank about you, ideas. Mr. Coffey. I've talked to thousands of people well, and maybe I didn't talk to the same people Jim did, but the uh, reaction to whether we should have an open space fund and how we should pay for it was mixed. Some people don't like the transfer tax. Some people feel like they've worked their whole life for their house. That's their main asset, and they want to be able to sell it, and they don't want to tax on it. I get that. But what I try to explain to people is if we have open space, if we value open space, the value of your house is going to increase. Also, if we decrease the housing stock, the value of your house is going to increase. So you're going to benefit when you sell that house because it's going to be worth more. I'm in favor of having a referendum and putting the vote to the people. That is what I'm in favor of, exploring the different alternatives, finding out what people want, and then putting it to a vote. I've heard a variety of opinions. Some hate the transfer tax. Some have come up to me and said that they're willing to pay a little bit of money to preserve open space because it's that important to them. So let's find out what the people want, and ultimately let's present it to the people and let the people vote on it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carriero. Well, you know, it's interesting you're saying that some people would be willing to pay. That's great. That's what I described as voluntary. And those discussions mean that you are willing to say one of our options is voluntary contributions. I think there are people in businesses, there are people in um, other walks of life that look at this and say, I want to leave a legacy to my community. I want to be known for having been good. It goes on all the time at Albany Medical Center and St. Peter's Hospital. Maybe we need to use some of those methods with government. It's okay to say to people, we can show you a plan and a way to accomplish this. But let's talk about your options. The developer concept is not a bad one, Mr. Coffey. I would concur. But let's sit down and start making these discussions voluntary and not forcing people to do them without further debate and deliberation. That's all I'm asking for. Thank you, sir. 
A little confused with the order at this point. I'll take <laughs> to be honest with you. Who started the first last Flip that Canadian coin again. Did you start the last one? I was rebutting. You were rebutting. He started the last one, yeah, yeah. I think, didn't he? Yeah. I'll start this one. Yes. Yes. It's my turn. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Somebody mixed up my order here. That's my fault. <laughs> Next question is to Mr. Coffee. The hamlet of Slingerlands has a historic area which is not currently protected by specific zoning laws. Would you support doing something to change that for Slingerlands and other historic areas in the town? And if so, how would it be structured? Yes, I am in favor of uh, extra protections for the historic parts of our town. Um, we need to be respectful of our history and we need, where there's areas such as the, uh, the Slingerlands family vault uh, near the former Manjas, uh, we need uh, extra protection for that, that property. Um, one thing we looked at on the planning board and the zoning board is does it meet the character of the neighborhood? The current proposal does not pass the, sn the sniff test and I understand it was not very well received at the public hearing that the planning uh, board had recently. Um, if it doesn't meet the character of the neighborhood, then it shouldn't be allowed to come in there. That's why we need to take a look at all of our zoning laws. And we need to, and as part of the comprehensive plan, look at the way that our different areas of our town have changed over the years so that when we restructure the zoning laws, we can carve out areas and say that this area is particularly deserving of extra protection. So that's something that's part of the process of reviewing the comp plan and, and revising the zoning laws so that areas of town Recently, the town developed something called a open space value map where they went and they gathered data and they put together a detailed map over using many, many different criteria. And one of the criteria was historic uh, significance. So in areas where there is historic significance, that's an area where it's deserving of special protection. And if we had this open space fund and it was um, a developer tried to develop it, we could buy up the development rights on it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carriero? Um, although I'm extremely sympathetic to this group that's leading the charge for this um, uh, designation, I do want the opportunity to sit down with them and talk with them and understand what their perspective is. I do have a concern about obligating the town to this strategy without knowing more about it. So, you know, I'm in this five months. I'm not at this 10 years. When I got a letter from them and they gave me the detail of what they were asking for, it was a little bit overwhelming. So I asked, I responded to them and said, I'd like to meet with you. I want to hear what their thinking is and how this would obligate the community going forward. And I'd actually turn to the rest of the board to say, give me your insights on this issue. I think that's a very reasonable approach. Moderation is okay. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Coffey? Um, I have researched the, uh, the, I got the same letter Jim did. I did respond to it um, and um, I followed the public hearing before the planning board and uh, my understanding that the current project does not uh, fit the character of that neighborhood and I wouldn't support it. Now that having been said, I'm not on the, you know, I'm not on the planning board and that's something that I've been trying to tell people as I go door to door. Most planning projects do not go before the town board, only plan development districts go before the town board. The planning board is in charge. One thing I would be in favor of, our planning board was reduced from seven members down to five to save a few dollars a few years ago. Given the pressure that we're feeling from development and all the projects, one thing I would like to look into is expanding the planning board back to seven members where the town board members do have oversight with the personnel that would be appointed to the planning board. And Mr. Carriero. Mr. Coffey, you just suggested a short time ago that there wasn't pressure on development. So now you're agreeing that there is pressure. I'm gonna to say to you that this is consistent with what we've experienced as citizens. We see us bursting at the seams. We feel like this town is for sale. And we think we're losing the quality of our neighborhoods and our community by overdevelopment. The conservation fund is not gonna be able to save all of that. There are things that should have been done through the comprehensive plan and enforcement of it and zoning that were not done. We gave exceptions to people to build buildings taller than, the, than what was allowed under zoning. We allowed them to expand beyond what was acceptable under zoning and we gave them exceptions. 
You can't have this both ways. You know, there's got to be rules. Why can't we abide by the rules? So I'm saying there's pressure on us. You're now agreeing with I'm, me. Thank you, sir. Next question is directed to Mr. Carriero. Communities across the country are facing the need to address an aging infrastructure of utilities, bridges, roadways, and sidewalks. Do you think our town is, excuse me, do you think our town government is adequately addressing this problem and why or why not? Well, I have a mixed answer. I think under the new, um, the, the leadership of Tiger, I think they've begun to address repairing our sidewalks. He's brought it in house. And as a result of that, they're using town labor to repair our sidewalks instead of adding new ones. So they bought the forms, they bought a new truck that lays these down and we're doing more uh, internally. That's a good thing. Um, the issue where I think our infrastructure is literally falling apart is exemplified by the fact announced here in this very room by the supervisor, we've had 75 water main breaks year to date. That's an indication your infrastructure is falling apart, literally. And so why is that happening? It's happening because we didn't have an infrastructure plan that was long-term, that every year we say, we're gonna replace so many miles of our water mains because they're aging. And how is that finance? Quite honestly, in other examples in Massachusetts that I've given you before, it was managed by using the, the fees that the, the developers and builders paid for each home they put into a development, that money was reallocated back to the water system to pay for its renewal. You cannot go on ignoring that our, our system underground that you can't see is falling apart. 75 water main breaks? It doesn't take a genius to figure out we've got a little problem here. So if your house had 75 breaks in it, you'd be calling the plumber and saying, we need to redo the whole place. I think that's where we're headed here. This is gonna become catastrophic if we don't catch it. Let's look at the, the, the water drainage issue. Let's add to that the fact that our infrastructure for sewage is under pressure. Walk on Beacon Road in the middle of the summer. It smells like you're at the sewage treatment plant. My God. What does it take to realize we need to start look underground at what we've got going here? Time, thank you. Mr. Coffey. We do have a long-term infrastructure plan. Since 2005, we've done long-term planning for infrastructure, the town has, rather. Yes, I agree with Jim that we have stresses from our infrastructure that needs to be addressed. We do have a five-year capital plan. We cannot simply dig up all the roads in town and fix them at once without blowing through the tax cap. Only 11 to 12 cents of every one of your tax dollars goes to pay for all the services that we get. So it's not gonna happen in one year, but yes, there is a system in place to address long-term capital expenses such as this. And I just wanna go back to one other thing Jim said. Uh, he claimed that I never said that we're under pressure from development, but then he went on to say that we're bursting at the seams. Yes, we are feeling pressure from development, but I'm not going to use hyperbolic language like we're bursting at the seams. We have pressure from development. Development needs to be managed better. Uh, but if you look at the data in terms of the number of building permits, the number of projects that the planning board has reviewed and approved, there has not been a spike in recent years. That's just a fact. In terms of sidewalks, I Hi. do give to... Thank you. Can you play my last card there? Thank you. In terms of sidewalks, um, yes, I do applaud uh, Tiger. I understand more sidewalks have been put in and repaired this year than in years past. I would be in favor of developing some methodology for ranking the sidewalks. Again, you cannot pay for all of this. They're extremely expensive to do, but there are state grants available. And for years in Washington, they talked about a bipartisan infrastructure bill. It hasn't happened. Hopefully someday Washington will get their act together and we will have federal money coming in for some of these water and sewer projects. But I've talked to people in Blessing Road, on Murray Road, um, down in uh, Trinity Place, and they're all dying to have sidewalks. With more traffic, it, you're literally taking your life in your hands on some of these roads where you have developments dumping into major streets. So I'm all in favor of moving forward on sidewalks, but having an open, transparent project where we rank the listing for them and that we make sure we spread the tax dollars around evenly so that folks in Selkirk, folks in North Bethlehem are not forgotten about that we're putting in sidewalks in all sections of town. Time. Thank you. Mr. Carrier, rebuttal. So uh, let's go back to sidewalks. The prior to Tiger's arrival, 
we had the same problem. Sidewalks were falling apart and the town was demanding more and more sidewalks. I mean, pretty much everywhere I went, everyone wants a sidewalk for Christmas. So I'm suggesting to you that he actually had to go to the town and say, stop adding more. We need to go back and repair what we're doing. If there were a five-year plan, if there were a 20-year plan, that's not what was exhibited. What was exhibited is I want more and we were building more without fixing what we had. That's not an indication of a plan. That's being reactionary. Tiger didn't do that. He said, we need to stop construction and we need to fix what we've got. That's the proof of the pudding. As far as going forward, again, it's okay to have differences of opinion. The difference is I'm gonna bark louder and I'm gonna get a little bit more emotional when I don't see us paying attention to the needs of the community. Time. That doesn't mean I need to have a fight, Time. but I have to speak up. I don't think we've been Mr. experiencing Carriero. that. Time. What, do I? You could use your card. Maybe. No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our next question is directed towards Mr. Coffey. The cost of insurance and employee benefits has spiked in recent years with no indication of slowing down. How should the town plan for these added costs knowing they are likely to come down? Or likely not to come down? Um, the best way, Mike, for dealing with that would be, um, again, shared services. A lot of communities are starting to pool together to deal with some of their health insurance, workers' liability, liability insurance. I think that's the best bet. Uh, as you indicate, it's not going to come down. The biggest, about 50% of our uh, town budget goes towards uh, paying our town employees. And quite frankly, I think you're getting a pretty good bang for the buck. Think of all the leaves that get picked up. Uh, think of the work that gets done on the sidewalk. Think of the snow removal. Again, 11 or 12 cents on the dollar is being paid for that. So I think you're getting a good bang for the buck. I support the employees. There's a proposed 2% COLA. I think it's the least we can do um, is to give them cost of living increases uh, every year. Um, in terms of how do we control the costs in terms of insurance and all that, there have been studies shown that if you can pool with other municipalities, the best way to be able to control insurance costs uh, would be um, to go through a consortium for health benefits um, or other um, communities to help bring down your premiums. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carrier. The reality is that uh, cost of insurance um, whatever method you use, medical insurance is skyrocketing. We had all hoped under reforms that came out of Washington that we were going to see that level off. It didn't happen, unfortunately. I think this is a reality we're all going to live with, that cost for employees are going to continue to escalate. And it's almost to the degree that you can't control it. It's not a controllable item. If there was such a thing as an effective method of using uh, consortiums, I'm very confident that Michael, our controller, would have started that process a long time ago. I don't think it's a, an option, but you know what? In business, you go back and re you review all your options when you can't bring a controlled cost down. So I would agree, let's use other methods. Let's see what others are doing to bring their costs down. But realistically, I don't think it's a valid approach. Um, it, or he would have used it. This guy is very good at what he does. Consequently, let's look at where these are real issues. For example, we have a police officer in town uh, who was recently run over by someone leaving Walmart that was shoplifting. In order to get away from the cop, she ran him over. She hit him so badly that his knee is damaged and he's out on workers' comp. Now, my son's a police officer. We put these people in harm's way and there are people that harm them because they're first on the scene, when the gunfire is shot, they go running towards it. I don't want to do something that's going to risk them not having the best medical coverage or to town employees. The reality is we have to provide them with good quality care. They have high risk jobs. And uh, although I'm very proud of my son, I understand that's an expensive proposition. But we need to have police. We need to have first responders. And you've got to have good insurance for these people. So the consequence is, if there's a solution, I would hope we can find Time. it. I think it's going to be one that's tough to find. Thank you. Mr. Coffey? Um, 
Yeah, I agree with Jim. Overall, insurance costs are, are going up, and uh, unfortunately, we're not getting the leadership in Washington that we need to, to, to fix the problem. Um, there have been studies that showed that, for example, single-payer insurance would save municipalities uh, plenty, but again, that's not something we on the town board would have any uh, control of. Um, I do support the police. Um, the police have extremely hazardous job. A lot of people in town think that this is nice, quiet uh, Bethlehem. It isn't. There's a lot of crime, um, and if anyone has spent some time over at our town court, um, as I have, you'll see um, there's... Um, we need to update our facilities and we need to give the police uh, all the support that we can. There was an issue with overtime a few years ago and fortunately um, that, is, that has been, been dealt with, um, but we need to look at the staffing levels there and we need to do all that we can to support our police. Thank you, sir. And I'm back. Mr. Carrier. So um, let's talk about overtime. When you bring a police force down to a level that um, is, is thinly ranked, the consequence is that overtime goes up. That's the danger of managing a police force too closely, and that's what happened here. We went too far in, in diminishing the police officers that were on duty, and the consequence was that our overtime skyrocketed. You actually have to find a medium ground. And you know, most cities are struggling with this. There's no easy answer to it, but what you can't do is diminish your police force to the point where you are risking their safety and the safety of the citizens. And that's where we were a few years ago. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to realize you have to have a rational, logical uh, view of how you do this and maintain stability and maintain services to people. Um, but those cuts that were engineered were done to cut back the cost of the police department and it ended up being too excessive. Time, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our last question going to be directed first to Mr. Carriero. How can town government be more transparent? What are your ideas to make it more so, or what are your concerns? Um, my concerns are that although governments always say they want to be transparent, the reality is when you pressure them, if you're disagreeing with them, they, they become very defensive. I think we have to just accept the fact that there needs to be a check and balance that the best proof of accountability is when you have two teams on the board that are making sure that government is acting appropriately. Then it's gonna be in the best interest of leadership to do what they said they were gonna do. But if they tend not to, the minority party or the majority party should blow the whistle. That was not happening here. And the consequence was many of the policies and procedures that we've experienced. Um, so number one is you have to have a strong two-party system. Number two is, you know, I almost feel as though political parties in our community has not served us well because we spend more time fighting with each other where it should be evaluating, is he the right guy or is this the right guy? Can you believe what we say? Do we have a track record? I think it's got to become more about who are we as people and why are we participating? I want to salute Dan for what he's done, the board for who's participated as our government. Do you know they're here at night when we go home? When we're watching TV, these people that we get angry with and criticize, they're working. They're doing the job of representing us. The question is, why aren't we here checking on what they're doing? So I think we have to have some responsibility for the fact that our government becomes imbalanced. It's our obligation as citizens to participate. And the fact that this room is so packed tonight is not just because Dan looked really good in the paper. I mean, that was a great photograph. I'm very jealous. Um, but it also has to do with the fact that we drove out citizens by our participation in government. Time. Thank you very much. I have Mr. it one back again, Mike. I'm sorry. The question. What was that? Oh, the question is. How can town government be more transparent? What are your ideas to make it more so? Or what are your concerns? Thank you. First, thank you, Jim, for the kind words about the photograph. <laughs> if you're voting on, on hair follicles alone, clearly <laughs> you're going to vote for Jim. Uh, it's my hairdresser. Yes. Um, I believe our town, as I've dealt with them over the years, and I've dealt with the various departments, they. Uh, have been open uh, and transparent to me, and I've filed foils and I've gotten responses. My 
view on running for office is 95% of what you deal with as a town board member does not fall up on the liberal conservative spectrum. It's, we all want good services and we all want to keep our taxes reasonably low. What I would focus on is your background. I'm an independent voice. Um, it doesn't matter if I have a D or an R or an I after my name. You vote on the person based on their background, education, experience, and I believe if you take the time to look at my qualifications, I feel that I'm the, the best uh, person for the position. Um, yes, I agree there need to be checks and balances, but sometimes in politics you get people who are disagreeable just for the sake of being disagreeable, and that's never been my philosophy. If I have a problem with a policy issue, I will say it, but I would never disagree with somebody just to try to score political points. So again, I think if you see my record on the zoning board and you see my background, um, I will always vote based on the evidence before me and not based on any kind of a, a political concern. Uh, but at the end of the day, you try your best to work with everybody, regardless of political affiliation. You try to work towards a consensus. Thank you, sir. Mr. Carrillo, rebuttal? rebuttal? How long is this one? One minute. Um, so I think that we have a scenario where history has shown us that you have to observe your government and participate in it. Um, and far too long, because, because of party considerations, we have failed to do that. I think there were times, Mr. Coffey, where you could have stood up to the system and said, I'm uncomfortable with this. But you've been a very good party loyalist, and I salute you for that. On the other hand, I think there was points in your career where you should have said, I'm uncomfortable with the impact this is going to have on the citizens. So I would say we desperately need to have a two-party system. If not, people that are willing to challenge authority, and I'm certainly willing to do that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Coffey, last rebuttal. Um, I'm not sure what, what specifically Jim is, is talking about. Uh, again, I've always been an independent voice, and I've always tried to do, what, number one, you do what's best for the citizens. I've walked on thousands of doors. I've knocked on thousands of doors. Jim has as well. You know, we talk about the transfer tax or anything that affecting our town. It's not about what I think. It's about what you think. It's about using the two things on the side of your head to listen to people and to solicit input. That's what you do as a public official. You don't do something because you want to do it. You do it because the majority of the people want to do it. And that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to go out and solicit opinions from everybody and to try to gather all the facts. A number of times on the zoning board when we didn't have enough facts, we would have two or three or sometimes four public forums to make sure that we gathered more information and allowed everybody to be heard. Great. Now we finish the question and answer. We go to closing. Um, Mr. Coffey, you get to do your closing, and then Mr. Carrier will have the final word. Thank you, John and Mike. Um, thank you to the spotlight and to the chamber. Thank you, all of you who came here tonight. Um, as a Yankees and Giants fan, I find myself with spare time these days, unfortunately. Um, I was at one event and I failed to uh, thank my wife, so I have to absolutely thank my wife Eileen and thank my daughters Sarah and Caitlin. Um, as many of you know, I ran last year, I'm running this year, um, and, and God willing, I might have to run next year depending on what happens next week. It's a lot of stress on the family, and I know what Jim's been through as well, so I applaud Jim. I would never question his commitment to the town. Anybody who's crazy enough to go out and wave a sign in very bad weather, obviously is committed to our town and to our future. We began tonight talking about civility, and uh, we're, most of what you deal with on the town board level doesn't mean you're a Democrat or a liberal, it just means that you wanna do what's best for the town. The number one response I get when I knock on people's doors and I say, what are you concerned about most? And people say, I'm pretty happy. That's Bethlehem, people are happy but the town doesn't run on autopilot. The town runs hard work by our supervisor, by elected official, and by our town employees. And we wanna continue that track. We wanna to continue to keep our taxes below the tax cap while doing uh, good services for everybody. That's a tough needle to thread. Uh, but I believe my background and experience working for government, managing a business, being a practicing trial attorney, uh, provides me with th that skill set uh, in order to do that. Um, you're going to go to the polls in, in uh, um, a week from now, and you're going to make um, um, a decision as to who to vote for for this one-year term. Who would be best 
um, to try to find solutions on moving our comprehensive plan forward, trying to set up an open space preservation fund so we have another tool in our arsenal so that we can bid for property development rights and try to stop some of the development that's going on around town. Voting is a privilege that some, many Americans take for granted. I hope you all get out and vote next week. Thank you. Hey. All right, Mr. Carriero, the last word. Well, uh, first of all, again, I'd like to thank all of you for being participants in this evening's event. Uh, I know we're decent people. We're both good men. Um, we're lucky to have families that support us. On the other hand, Terry will never speak to me again after this experience. <laughs> it's things, Dan, do you have an extra room? So um, this was a very, ch it's beyond anything I imagined. Um, but when you're up against a very large uh, organization that's well organized and has the majority of voters, it's a tough battle. So you pull out all stops. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, I'm glad that I was a civics lesson teacher at most homes and in the street. If you can imagine on 9W people st pulling over to talk to me about the election. Unbelievable, trucks screaming by, people screaming at me, I want to sign, unbelievable experience. Um, but I was, I think I was a hell to my profession. I was a good social studies teacher and a good banker. I think we are good people. I think the people that lead us are very decent Americans that want to do the best for us. Having said that, I think sometimes you need someone who's willing to challenge the status quo and that maybe the status quo made mistakes that they said they were going to correct 15 years ago and they didn't. Don't judge us. Don't judge us because we chose to stand up and run for office. Judge us because we both had good ideas and we want to be participants in the system and we believe in our democracy. Our leaders are good people. Sometimes they just make bad decisions and that's why I'm here, to check on them. Having said that, thank you all for being so gracious and listening. Fantastic. Well, that concludes our program tonight, and I'd like to thank the candidates for both showing up. That's a really good thing. And also the audience. You guys were great. Please go out and vote on Tuesday, November 6th, and a round of applause.